Hello. Um, first off, uh, my name my name is Joe Crescenti. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, but we want to uh, thank you for tuning in to this session of Media Literacy Discussion Club. Uh, don't be a stranger. Let us know what you thought about this program by liking it or leaving a comment. And to join our other AMC online programs, subscribe to our YouTube channel, check out updates on our website, amc.ru, and follow us on social media to learn, connect, and produce together. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing well. This is a new format uh, for this little seminar series that we do. Um, you will be able to post questions on YouTube, and then uh, those will be forwarded uh, to me. So without further ado, and I apologize for the delays. There were some technical issues, unfortunately. Um, so we're going to begin you know, uh, with the, the initial slide. So the title of this presentation is fact-checking and identifying misinformation in the age of the coronavirus. I'm sure that pretty much everybody should be familiar with what that is. And what do, this is not a joke, obviously, but uh, what do COVID-19 and social media misinformation have in common? They're both viral and can spread very quickly. So change slide. Uh, first off, let's remember what it means to fact check. Refresher, brief refresher course for those of you who I might have seen at the American Center, you know, some months ago. Uh, you don't need to be a media professional to gain sufficient proficiency in this field. Much like any of the other aspects of media literacy, a healthy dose of skepticism in any media, including social media or news you read, is enough to get started. Change slide. The ability to look at information and quickly scan for misleading statements Outlandish headlines, potential errors, and erroneous details will help you rebut untruths and incomplete facts in your personal and professional lives. Uh, the most basic def change slide. The most basic definition of fact checking is to investigate something in order to verify the facts. Change slide. Uh, in an article, Alan Lettered, Alan Miban, and Orna Young at Fact Check NI, an independent fact checking organization, give a fuller definition. Change slide. Uh, Leonard, Mebon, and Young state that fact-checking exists within specific cultural, political, and social contexts. In other words, you can't divorce a piece of news from the place and the time where it's occurring and being created. They also suggest that fact-checking, change slide, is a, is a form of critical investigative inquiry. So clearly it is not simply the checking of numbers and objective facts, uh, much like we will uh, see today. Okay, so change slide. I've identified several types of misinformation uh, that you can look out for these days, you know, during this time. Uh, and at this time, I encourage you to fact check everything you come across that's not from a trusted source, but especially, especially from social media. Change slide. Um, so I, I've tried really hard, you know, I've been, I basically over the last week, you know, asked a, a lot of different people, uh, acquaintances, friends, academics, other journalists, uh, you know, what are the motivations, uh, you know, uh, so I asked them to basically all, all sorts of acquaintances I have to send me, you know, uh, different, different uh, misinformation or misleading information, kind of examples they've come across. And I've looked at, I don't know, hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And I've tried really hard to understand the motivations of those that spread misinformation. I, I can't quite figure it out. You know, is it simply to lie, to make a joke, to convince people of something, to prey on the gullible and the vulnerable populations, uh, to release anxiety, to cause panic, to stir distrust, naivete, uh, simply evil? I don't know. I think it's, you know, there's different motivations and some of them take several of these, some of these, you know, go to uh, different, uh, you know, take different parts of it and put it together. But I don't think there's one motivation of those. You know, I think some people think they're trying to help. I think some people, uh, you know, 
probably don't even realize what they're doing. Uh, but there's there's some more you know kind of negative actors out there definitely playing with information at this time, and so that's why it's especially crucial to you know um, be on top of that to the best of your ability. Change slide. So the how. Uh, the how is information able to spread so so quickly um, and without too much you know punishment right now is that there's an information vacuum you know not everything can be known uh, despite the fact that every you know I feel like a lot of people really want to know everything there is to know you know I want to know exactly what to think about this or something like that you know and anxious situations I think that's the case. Um, People want answers. They want simple narratives. And so they are probably even more willing than usual to listen uh, to easy answers, you know, than they would be at, at another time. I think people are a little bit more vulnerable towards uh, stuff at the moment, you know, uh, especially when not everything's known. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties, you know, about how things are going to you know, go down around the world. And so. Uh, you know, people fall prey to, to easy answers sometimes during these kind of moments, anxious moments. Um, so the most popular category, though, that I've identified, you know, and I've had, I don't know, two dozen people maybe send me some of the, for lack of a better term, greatest hits of uh, terrible inf misinformation that's going around the Internet. The number one is probably secondhand medical expertise, bad medical information. Um, this is probably the most popular category of misinformation going on out there right now. And it's probably also the most worrisome, in my opinion, category, uh, because populations such as the elderly and the isolated are vulnerable, particularly vulnerable to such uh, misinformation. And I think that, you know, uh, probably, uh, change slide, uh, I, got, I got motivated to think of a presentation along these lines when my 78-year-old 70 78 neighbor here in Moscow, uh, for the following message, which she received in WhatsApp. You know, she initially shared it with us, you know, thinking it was good information. Um, and, you know, maybe you've seen this one. Uh, it's from a guy, a doctor named Yura Klimov. As you can read here, you know, young young doctor from the Russian Federation who works in a hospital in China and, you know, has been studying, uh, you know, uh, was studying their pneumonia in, in Wuhan province. And he called, you know, his his uh, his close ones and gave gave an explanation. Right. Started to tell everybody. Right. So this is this is not the person, you know, it wasn't like Yurta Klimov went to my neighbor and said, hey, you know, uh, you know, so and so, you know, you, you know me, I'm that doctor. Uh, here's some great information for you. Uh, instead, it's like secondhand from a person who knows a person who knows another person. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what's in this large, quite large, uh, you know, uh, message, which came through WhatsApp, um, the giveaway is that something was off were pretty quick for me. I mean, I'm very skeptical of any kind of messages you would get about health information pretty much anywhere, but especially on social media, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp in particular, people sending stuff, uh, forwarding stuff and so on. Uh, trust, I trust, trust health authorities at this time, I guess is my, is my biggest, uh, takeaway from medical advice. But the doctor, the giveaways that something was off here was this doctor. Uh, Taiwanese doctors, Japanese infectious disease specialists, and my favorite in, in the message, according to recent data. Um, so two questions that came to me really quickly is if they're not, you know, if they're such an expert, why are they not appearing in legitimate sources, right? If this person is not, has such a, a window, a special window into this information, uh, you know, why aren't they getting an interview on television or uh, another legitimate, you know, form of, of news, you know, a website, a serious website getting interviewed, right? Why are they appearing like, hey, I know this doctor in China, you know? Uh, kind of thing and spread around. That's one thing that's set, set off. And then another is, why are all the sources here totally anonymous, totally anonymous, right? J you know, Japanese specialists, Taiwanese, you know, doctors, et cetera, et cetera, without any links, any links, so that people can check the information they provided for themselves. Change slide. Um, 
generally, you know, uh, here in this in this message, right, it's filled with tons of questionable medical advice, such as, you know, gargling hot water can help beat the virus. Keeping your mouth moist is important. Different methods for self-diagnosis, none of which you'll see on any government, scientific, or any other uh, legitimate website, right? Um, and this is the same kind of stuff that we saw, uh, you know, for those of you who came to the media literacy seminars that we had back in, you know, January, February, uh, at the very beginning of all this, you know, that we were seeing in the Philippines, you know, six, eight weeks ago, being spread around on social media, uh, you know, you will not see this, you know, on the different scientific, you know, government websites from around the world. You know, um, you, you do see this, unfortunately, though, in places like in these WhatsApp messages. Um, so what happens? Uh, change slide. What happens when you search for this Yorta Klima? Uh, fortunately, change slide. Uh, you find stuff like this. Um, Dr. Yorta Raskazal, you know, and so on this slide. Right. Um, you know. It states here, you know, that the, the, the advice being given there uh, is considered dangerous. Change slide. Uh, here's another one, right? Klima Bjora Vrach is Rasiski Federatsi, blah, 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 blah. Pachimu et the fake, right? Why is this fake? You know, et cetera, et cetera. Change slide. Unfortunately, unfortunately, for every one of, the, of these posts that cast doubt on Klima's expertise, there's another one that's spreading it. Um, so, and I did a search and there's, there's plenty of results for both camps, I guess you could say. Um, similar, you know, to this case, there's another one that's being spread uh, both in Russian and English about a guy named Gregory G. Pure. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, from the University of Pennsylvania Children's Hospital, Philadelphia, also supposedly part of the Stanford Hospital Board. Um, and some of Hewer's points, you know, very similar message to this uh, Klimov one. Um, some of his points, you know, uh, a major specialist, right, you know, doctor uh, at a major hospital. This new virus is not heat resistant and will be killed by a temperature of just 26, 27 degrees. This is a very popular stuff I've seen dozens of times. Hates the sun. You know, so once it gets warm, we'll be fine. The jury's still out on that. Um, <laughs> definitely. Uh, you know, uh, drinking warm water is effective for all viruses. Try not to drink liquids with ice. That's very bizarre advice. Um, wash your hands frequently as the virus can only live on your hands for five, 10 minutes. Uh, but a lot can happen during that time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is actually a, a piece of good advice that's snuck in there, which I'll get to in a second. You know, this is actually the kind of advice you will find on government websites. You know, if you go to Moscow City website, they will definitely have a piece of information like that. Uh, maybe not about the live on your hands for five to 10 minutes. I don't know about that, but definitely washing the hands and some other good habits, you know, to do, you'll find that, you know, for various city websites, federal websites, websites in the United States, all over the place. Uh, here's another one though. You should also gargle as a prevention, a simple solution of salt and warm water is advice. I can't emphasize enough. Drink plenty of water. I mean, I have not seen I mean, it's always a good idea, I think, probably to be hydrated, but I've not seen that in related to helping somebody get over uh, coronavirus or preventing it, uh, certainly. Um, here's another thing. This one, this was, this is in Italy, uh, about ibuprofen, you know, Tylenol, uh, aspirin, stuff like that, and uh, the coronavirus. Um, this one contained real information. However, the thing is, this doctor, this particular doctor who you see there, um, uh, you never, he never wrote it. Change slide. Um, and here, if, if you can see, is a um, is a, a chat that happened uh, related to that. Uh, uh, that article was posted, right? Uh, Martin McCormick stating, it appears to be true. It was printed in the British medical journals based on French doctor's experience. <laughs> David Arison says, it might be, but it was not something written by the doctor it had been attributed to. And then Aronson concludes with a very good question. The puzzling thing is, <clears throat> if the source was this article from an authoritative source, why did they pretend it had been written by that particular doctor? It's a very good question. Um, so uh, why, you know, that just raises my, skeptic, uh, my skepticism like a meter. It just goes way up, it, you know, when I see... You know, taking something out of context, placing it in another context, taking good information and placing it in somebody else's hands. Why is that being done? 
I mean, I, 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 I don't think that's, that these kinds of actions are random. So why? Changing a slide. You know, um, people can do a search and find any of these doctors that you've seen. The American doctor that I mentioned, uh, the Russian doctor. You can find doctors uh, named Yuri Klimov and Hure, Gregory Hure and uh, this Italian guy. They're all real people. Um, and that can lead other people to think this information is real. Uh, you know, but whether or not they're really saying what they're supposedly saying is another question, right? Uh, people will do this a lot with fake news is they'll take somebody and just invent, you know, they'll take a, a statement from somebody who's not an authority and place it in authority's mouth. But it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, that person is actually saying it. And if they're not really saying it, then that's not a legitimate quotation. Uh, here's another popular one, um, change slide uh, that, you know, if you can see, I'll just uh, summarize basically what it says here. Uh, this one is going in, uh, in Russian, I guess in English as well. Uh, before, you know, the coronavirus gets into your lungs, it spends four days in your throat. It just has like a little vacation in your throat for four days, exactly, four days. Uh, at this time, you know, uh, a person is going to have, you know, throat pain and a cough, but if you drink uh, a lot of water and, you know, swirl around some hot, you know, salted water, uh, et cetera, you know, you, you'll kill the virus. Uh, you know, here, please share this with all the people so they knew, you know, what to do to, you could save somebody's life, you know, but there's this is just not, you know, there's no evidence that that is necessarily true <laughs> at all. Uh, another one uh, that's kind of related that I saw just today. Vitamin C, change slide, uh, vitamin C can truthfully be designated as the antitoxic, um, hold on one second, antitoxic and antiviral vitamin by this uh, Dr. C.W. Jung, Jungblut. Okay, now this is a real doctor. Okay, and, and the person below in Italian, I've learned enough Italian to be able to read you know, these kinds of statements. Uh, this is true. But on TV, they're saying that this is fake. <laughs> it's a great comment. Uh, and I, don't, I honestly don't know if that person is being sarcastic or not. The sunglasses don't quite give it away to me. Um, I, think, I think this person probably believes it. Um, true, to change slide. Uh, vitamin C um, is pretty good. Nobody's going nobody's gonna to doubt that, right? It's really good for uh, building the, uh, uh, the, immune, the immune system. But this doctor did research in the 1930s, right, 80, 90 years ago, and knew nothing about this particular virus. So how could they be an expert about this particular virus? And it's not like in the last 80, 90 years, the scientific community hasn't gotten uh, to learn tons of information uh, about, you know, uh, viruses, right? But it provides an easy and unfortunately unscientific piece of advice that people can easily fall prey to. Now. Vitamin C, you know, might be great to take at this time, but it's, there's no evidence that taking a lot of vitamin C or eating a lot of garlic, et cetera, et cetera, is going to, uh, you know, prevent a virus from, you know, getting infected by a virus. Um, exaggerated truths, change slide. So this is stuff that's not completely false. Nation gap. Uh, people might think they will perhaps influence policy. Um, or, or debates uh, with these half-truths. Okay, sorry. If they got all this, why aren't we getting this? You know, uh, this is actually just a very lazy kind of thing that was not hard to fact-check at all, right? Basically, put in Canada coronavirus measures, uh, you find out that, you know, you could change to two slides ahead. Most of this information is not true. Um, it's a mix of proposals, i.e. things that haven't happened yet, uh, incomplete facts, such as the income figures, which would only help out those potentially, potentially that have been impacted by the coronavirus, not everyone in Canada, and uh, untruths, zero evidence that mortgages and rents are being frozen in Canada. So why, 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 would, why would somebody share something like this? You know, um, is it just that, you know, they, they just want, you know, to, to get a lot of likes? It could be as simple as that. Is this like, you know, the ideal scenario that they'd like, you know, in, a, in the country where they're living, you know, that mortgages and rent will get frozen and everybody will get paid some money. 
Um, you know, and they're dissatisfied maybe with their own government's response to that, et cetera. I don't know, you know, uh, perhaps, but it's not true. So, I mean, I doubt that this, you know, is a very influential post, although it did get shared. That's how I came to learn about it. So twice shared uh, by people with good, with good educations. Um, and that's another thing I'll get to at the end is, you know, uh, you should definitely be skeptical of, you know, Everyone, you know, even those with with, with extraordinary educations, uh, in some ways, you know, they can they're often the ones uh, that I catch, you know, uh, sharing half truths uh, as much as anybody else. OK, uh, so change slide moving forward. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of instances of taking photographic evidence. Um, and we'll have a little bit more on this kind of phenomenon at the very end and some things you can do from the past and making it sound like it's happening right now. So, for example, this photo was spread quite, uh, uh, quite wide. Uh, but this is from a completely unrelated disaster in 2013. You know, this has nothing to do. There, there is no scene that you can find of coffins like this currently that we know, you know. Uh, but people are using that to get your emotions going. Look at the tragedy. And there's no denying that it is a tragedy. But this photo is completely taken out of context. Uh, fortunately, some people have called it out. This is happening from 2013. Another example is... This scenario, which was shared uh, pretty widely, I guess, in, uh, in Europe. I can't remember exactly the country, although I know the source. Um, so this was basically saying, like, look at people, you know, uh, fighting over, you know, groceries. Uh, they can't get anything. You know, I, I think the idea is, you know, maybe people. You know, kind of wild and uh, fights broke out. And so this is being kind of repackaged uh, uh, frequently uh, in social media to, you know, which caused some kind of like, you know, anxiousness or panic and, you know, go out and get shopping. This kind of stuff doesn't help. And, you know, it definitely does not help the mood uh, that people have right now. You know, it's really important to stay as calm as we can. Um, and it's not true. It's not true. You know, this scene didn't actually happen. If you have an actual scene, you know, uh, that's that's a little bit different. But this one isn't even true. You know, if you really need to find something, you know, why do you have to have this image that's completely false? Whether it's, you know, coffins in Bergamo, supposedly in Bergamo, they weren't there at all. Or this image, you know, from a French supermarket from several years ago. Next slide, animals. Now, <laughs> uh, animals are... Are, are, even animals are being used in these, you know, kind of misinformation um, volleys that are being, you know, thrown all over the internet, right? Even look cute little animals. Has anybody seen, for example, the dolphins in the canals story? Um, so, you know, there were a variety of tweets, uh, uh, change slide, so the dolphins in the canals one. There were a variety of tweets about dolphins appearing in the canals of Venice, right? And if you could see, these are two different tweets. They're both enormously popular. One of them says on the left, Jack, thought I'd spread a bit of positivity for you guys. Since the lockdown of Venice, without the pollution from the boats, the water has been gunned to clear up and a dolphin has been spotted in the canal for the first time in nearly 60 years. Hashtag Venice. Or Gianluca DeSantis says, Venice hasn't seen clear canal water in a very long time. Dolphins showing up too. Nature just hit the reset button on us, right? It's like... Easy answer. We got an easy answer, right? Uh, clearly, you know, us sh shutting down as nature is going to come back full throttle. Na we're, we're abundant, you know, positivity, good stories. Uh, we want good stories. I think a lot of people do right now, for sure. Um, there's also this tweet uh, about about swans uh, returning to, to Venice. Um, and this one got more than a million likes. 
Uh, this is by Caveri, right? Here an unexpected side, here's an unexpected side effect of the pandemic. The water is flowing through the canals of Venice. It's clear for the first time and forever. The fish are visible. The swans returned. Okay, chain slide. But for the most part, none of this stuff is true. All right? The swans, for example, never left. They were always there in Venice. Um, and this person who's commenting on the swan situation in particular, Ahua, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, doesn't live in Venice, was not in Venice last week or two weeks ago or three weeks ago when they uh, posted this. Uh, Ahua, uh, who lives in New Delhi, India, says she saw some photos on social media and decided to put them together in a tweet, unaware that the swans were already regulars in Verano, which is, uh, I believe, the canals. Uh, there in Venice, before the coronavirus tour across Italy. Quote, the tweet was just about sharing something that brought me joy in these gloomy times, she says. She never expected it to go viral or cause any harm. I wish there was an edit option on Twitter just for moments like this. Um, change slide. Nonetheless, she hasn't deleted the tweet and doesn't plan to, arguing that it's still relevant because the waters in Venice are clearer than usual, a result of decreased boat activity, and that's what matters, she said. She's tweeted about the unprecedented number of likes and retweets she's received on the tweet. It's a personal record for me, and I would not like to delete it, she says. So, change slide. Is it, is it her responsibility to delete this, this tweet? This is a question we've talked about many times. You know, people post something, it turns out to be wrong, but you know, they like the message, you know, regardless of what the outcome is, right? And uh, you know, this keeps spreading. I'm sure that you know, thousands of people saw this tweet today, you know, um, and were like, oh, the, the swans came back, oh, the do or maybe they saw the dolphins, you know, the dolphins, you know, are coming back, Na mother nature, you know, look at all this positivity. Um, but d does somebody like that have a responsibility to lead, you know? I mean, I'll leave this question for you. It's kind of hard to have a, a real discussion, you know, when um, I'm talking into a computer screen and I'm not, uh, but you know, this is a question we've discussed before in my media literacy seminars and I'll, I'd be happy to discuss again. Um, you know, the information is changed. That information is no longer relevant. People are still believing your information. They're getting lifts out of this information. Their mood is increasing and that's a good thing, but there are consequences to that, which we'll see in a minute. Um, so change slide, National Geographic. So this is an article that was in National Geographic in the past about a week. Um, quote, these reports of wildlife triumphs in countries hard hit by the novel coronavirus got hundreds of thousands of retweets. They went viral on Instagram and TikTok. They made news headlines. If there's a silver lining of the pandemic, people said, this was it. Animals were bouncing back running free in a humanless world. Next slide. Um, these fake feel-good stories can make people even more distrustful at a time when everyone already feels vulnerable. Finding out good news isn't real can be even more demoralizing than not hearing it at all. Um, here you can, you, can find, uh, you, know, you can find a link to this, uh, this article uh, if you'd like to read the whole thing. Um, yeah, you know, this can actually do the opposite of what you, you know, people hope to do. One hundred percent true. They might just get more cynical about stuff, and that's what you're trying not to do. You're trying to, you know, get people uh, more uplifted, and uh, the opposite result is actually what can take place. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is the, probably the most ridiculous thing. Absolutely the most ridiculous thing. This is apparently quite popular in Italy, uh, but not only in Italy. I think it's also popular in some other European countries. This was, I'm almost 100% positive that this was not actually shown on Rai News 24, which is an Italian state network. <laughs> but, you know, I'll read the, I'll translate the Italian for you. Um, uh, Russia releases 500 lions into the streets to guarantee the quarantine. Uh, which, you know, A, A, there's so many things that are wrong about this. A, as many of you know, in Russia, you know, we have, we've, uh, there's some measures that have been announced just in the last couple of days in particular. Some were announced before, but nothing close to 
<laughs> definitely having lions on the street, uh, you know, enforcing some kind of quarantine. People are allowed to leave for the most part, um, you know, with the exception of uh, certain certain social groups that they're asking to stay at home. Um, but obviously, it's pretty ridiculous, but it's spreading. I don't know if people are used doing it to have a laugh or whatnot. Okay, so I fact checked this. This is in South Africa. Uh, a lion escaped uh, some time ago. This has nothing to do with Russia. I mean, if you've ever been to Russia, you would know that this doesn't look like Russia. Um, I don't think, I hope nobody believed it. I'm sure some people did, though, because, you know, there's some gullible people out there uh, who will believe just about anything. But this is probably the most ridiculous thing I saw this week, for sure. Uh, going forward, next slide. Fact check images and videos. Um, and there'll be, I have, a, I have an article you can read uh, if you want to get some tips specifically on how to do that um, in a couple slides. Um, but like this is a great example, right, of what is done all the time by media, right? First case of coronavirus confirmed in Manhattan. And here's a, a state lawmaker in, in New York State. Uh, and they're saying, so then why are you using a photo of an Asian man in Flushing, Queens, right? She, She's pointing out, Alessandra Biaggi is pounding out here, pointing out here that, you know, A, this is not Manhattan, and B, uh, uh, didn't say anything about, about uh, Asian Americans or Asians uh, in, in, the original, in the original post. It's just like, you know, play, preying on people's, you know, confirmation bias, maybe, uh, some of their prejudices that people might have uh, about the coronavirus. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, this is a great example uh, of people in the media just occasionally using completely and, and social media a lot. Right. As we can go back to the lion photo that we just had using a photo uh, completely out of context. Um, a lot of times and sometimes they're wrong. Um, and these things are not too hard uh, to figure out or to find anymore. Next slide. Uh, so here's the article. Here's a, a Here's a, a good article in particular. If uh, the next slide is about, it's called Five Quick Ways We Can All Double Check Coronavirus Information Online. You can access it there. Um, and what it says, uh, I'll, I'll get to what it, some things that it says in a minute. Uh, but if we look at the next slide, you know, uh, generally there, there are a lot of examples, I think, out there as well about people trying to find a culprit, a scapegoat, trying to find an answer. Oh, you know, um, you know, my father shared something with me this week, and I think I've, I've, I've gotten to him enough that he says, okay, I, I think you should check this. You know, he's, he's even doubting some of the things that he normally uh, shares with me, and that's good. Uh, means he's, he's, he's learning, uh, you know, uh, to, to be a little bit more careful with the information. And actually, the, 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 the thing that he had, you know, wasn't necessarily a bad article, if you're listening to out there. Um, it wasn't bad. Most of the information was true. Uh, but you know, it doesn't do anything. You know, uh, I think a lot of people are looking for a very, uh, quick answer. Oh, it started here at this exact place. And then whew, what you can relax. It, 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 you can't relax. Right. You know, here's a quiz question. Did the Spanish flu originate in Spain? The answer is no. Most indications are that it started elsewhere and uh, it was named the Spanish flu because it was during World War One, and there were some people who were disappointed, you know, with that Spain had not joined World War One, and they, you know, you know, kind of used this uh, to their advantage, and it stuck. You know, people call the the 1919 flu epidemic, which was widely considered the worst or one of the worst, but it sticks. You know, so people trying to find an easy answer right now. There's there's a lot of people out there trying to do it. So be skeptical of things that people are sharing. People want to give you, you know, a recipe for, you know, if you is, is just, we're, we're much more connected. And there's a lot of positivity to that, right? But, you know, it does mean that in times like this, things like this, uh, unfortunately, can spread a lot more quickly than they could say in 2003 with SARS. Um, you know, at that time, as I said before, right, uh, China was just joining the world economy. A lot of economies were coming into the w uh, World Trade Organization and different <laughs> global economic organizations, um, we weren't nearly as bound together economically and, you know, travel, et cetera, et cetera, as we are now. Um, and so, you know, I think it's best, you know, uh, not to forget that it's, it's a global problem. Um, and I'll leave that at that. Uh, so going to the next slide, here are some tips you can use 
um, to get through this challenging time while wading through the misinformation, exaggerated claims, and misleading tidbits uh, that are swirling around out there. Next slide. Uh, what you can do, one thing, you know, uh, a lot of us around the world, right, are probably going to be spending a lot of time at home in the next week, two weeks, coming weeks, etc. Uh, some things you can do when you talk, get on the phone, you know, it's not a bad idea, especially with grandparents, parents, maybe neighbors, uh, you know, ask people what they, what they know or what, they, what they've heard, et cetera, et cetera, uh, about the coronavirus, right? Um, if they're not good fact checkers, you know, maybe ask them to forward, you know, any potential misinformation to you so that you can help them do it, do it for them, help them do it, show them what you did, uh, just do a quick fact check, um, you know, because there's probably a lot of people out there that are going to, you know, fall prey to some of these, you know, less than scientific uh, you know, kind of remedies that are popping around the internet. And, you know, that's definitely one thing you can do is help, you know, people who are not so media literate, media savvy, uh, you know, uh, not fall prey to these kinds of hoaxes and, uh, you know, misinformation and so on. Uh, next slide. Uh, another thing you can do, be skeptical of even your smartest friends. I've always found as much as I don't want this to be true, I've almost I've always found that some of the most deceptive misinformation is from the smarter friends. I guess that shouldn't be that surprising. But people I would expect better share stuff a lot that they don't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, see anything wrong with it. If it gets, you know, bigger, if it points to a bigger picture, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, um, this can have consequences, right? You know, many of the examples I shared today we're shared by people with good educations, you know, uh, who should know better, I think, honestly. Um, my experience has shown uh, that people tend to trust people who they perceive, in, and, and there's scientific research on this as well. People tend to trust people who they perceive to be more educated, um, uh, but, but educated people are not less likely to share less than optimal information. Um, so... I would leave medical expert, you know, medical advice, you know, leave that to the experts. Do not listen to your engineering friend, no matter no how smart they are, um, et cetera. Uh, next, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, so from that article that I posted a little bit before, five quick ways we can all double check the coronavirus, et cetera. Uh, here's a couple good points in there. Some stories are too good to be true. The dolphins in the canals, you know, et cetera. Uh, not all research is uh, created equal, right? And think before you share. And uh, next slide. Uh, when should we uh, believe that there was a, hold on. Okay, um, uh, uh, so uh, we'll, we'll have time in a second for questions if there are any. Uh, but another time, when, when should we be skeptical? So this slide, uh, I think a good rule of thumb is to be skeptical if something makes you laugh, makes you angry, or makes you emotional. I think we had all three of these, there, right? I don't know if the, the Lions tweet was, was set up to make people laugh. Uh, you know, uh, the angry, I mean, you know, giving, giving bad advice, not medical, non-medical advice to old people, that, that makes me angry. Uh, you know, coffins lined up in what looks like a church or a gymnasium in Italy, you know, makes you emotional, et cetera, et cetera. If any of this happens, ask yourself, is this news? Uh, you know, th there's definitely going to be some stuff that, you know, makes you a little bit emotional these days. But if something seems destined to do it and it's not, you know, information. Um, ask yourself, you know, is this news? Should I be skeptical? Um, here's one more uh, slide about some other things you can do. This is general stuff I say for social media. Uh, I'm sorry for media literacy, but, you know, I think this applies very much so to, to some of the stuff that's going on right now. Fact check. If something smells off, it's probably gone bad, you know, just like you would, you know, if you smell something in the fridge, you open your fridge, you, you find out what it is, right? If you, if you see something that just doesn't look right, uh, check it out, right? Let somebody know politely if they're wrong. 
you know, uh, I think a lot of people have let this, uh, this, this woman in India who had this uh, tweet about, you know, the revival of um, nature and the Venice canals coming back, uh, you know, this person doesn't see anything wrong with spreading something that's not true as long as it, you know, points to a larger, more positive kind of picture. But, you know, it also shows that people, you know, start to really, you know, when they, when they fall for something like that and find out it's not true, they get very cynical about other things. So ask yourself when you're posting something, you know, is this going to have consequences beyond that happy rush of a feeling people get for a few seconds when they looked at it, when they find out it might not be a hundred percent true. Um, you know, ask yourself that question. There are consequences to these things. Um, examine sources, right? If you get a source from some, I know a doctor. Hey, if you see, I know a doctor, you know, your, your skeptical meter should be like going into overdrive. Um, but you know, especially look at sources. Uh, you, you'll see very quickly, uh, in a lot of these things that are spreading around WhatsApp and Facebook and email, et cetera, that, uh, a lot of the sourcing is, a dean expert, one expert, uh, a specialist from this place, without telling you who it is, what their title is, what is their authority to make that kind of determination, right? Um, and, you know, according to the latest data, what kind of latest data are you referring to? You know, a good journalist would share that with you. Uh, a, good, a good doctor would share that with you. Uh, a good scientific specialist would share that with you. If they're not, there might be a reason for it. And it might be that the information is not good or is not authoritative. Right? So also figure out who it is you're reading and be conscious of your choices and activities, as I mentioned before. Right, Your actions online do have consequences. Um, and I'll end on this note, and I'll take any questions if people have them. Uh, is this a new trend? There was a guy in Florida, USA, uh, during spring break who was caught uh, within the last two weeks in an interview and he was partying during spring break and there's a lot of people around, nobody's doing any social distancing. And he's just like, if I get Corona, I get Corona, you know, you know, basically the idea that, you know, I don't care. It's not going to affect me, you know? Um, but his defiance of this, you know, uh, den you know, uh, 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 of some of the measures that were being asked of people, um, uh, to do social distancing guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, drew a lot of criticism and widespread attention. Um, and he, as a result, has apologized um, for his, you know, the, the statements that he made. He says, I'm aware of the severity of my actions and comments. You know, um, if you make a comment, uh, you know, uh, or you, you, you do something like you post about swans, you know, I know, you know, you feel great. You know, you got all these likes, but if it's wrong information, you know, just realize that, you know, or if. there is a possibility to atone, you know, apologize, take down your tweet that had some information that might not have been correct, et cetera, et cetera. Even if you feel like, well, but nobody cares or, um, you know, uh, it's not important because, you know, I believe, you know, that uh, nature, you know, you know, we should, we should be focusing on nature and how we can bring it back. And, you know, I bet I can, a lot of people will, take notice of the environment as a result of this, et cetera, et cetera. But you're probably losing just as many people once they find out that it's not true, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I think that, you know, if, if this guy who was so adamant, you know, like about, oh, this is not serious, can come back and say this is serious, um, then there's hope for, you know, anybody. I, I mean, I wish that the, uh, you know, uh, person with the swan uh, tweet would, would come out and do it just because, you know, in a time of uh, uh, we're, we're having some trust issues around the world, uh, you know, I think the truth is, you know, important. And whenever you are become aware that uh, something is not true, you should do your best to rectify it, uh, not just, you know, uh, continue to get your likes and get your, you know, your, your social media buzz as, as a result of that. OK. Uh, and the final slide. Thank you for your attention. I am happy to take any questions if there are. I've gotten um, one comment that said, thank you, what a relief to hear a sober and critical mind. Thank you. Media literacy is what we need these days, of course. I agree with that. Um, I think we'll hang on for a couple minutes if people have questions. They may not. I have no idea how many people are watching out there.
Yeah. Can you name some credible, trustworthy sources is a question I've got. And I get this question a lot. Um, to be a media literate person, um, I think one thing to remember is, you know, you've got you to figure out what you're – I mean, I'm, ta- I'm speaking generally at first, and then I'll get a little bit more specific. Um, generally, you've got to figure out for you what is information you trust. And you build up trust with, you know, a friend – by spending time with them and relying on them. And it turns out that they were true. You know, they did something for you and you, you, you're able to rely on them. Similarly, when you read a, a publication, um, the more you read them, the more you see that they're giving good information, um, the more you build up trust with them. I personally read the New York Times. Does the New York Times get things wrong? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, do they have biases? They certainly do. Um, but I, but I know them, I know them really well. I learned what their biases are. And so I can kind of a little bit, see what they are. I could see what their blind spots are in some ways. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, generally, you know, uh, uh, big publications are good, but you, you've got to make the decision. What information do you need? One source of information is going to be good for this, but it might be a, not a great source for this, right? For breaking news, I go to the New York Times. But there's a variety of other really good, uh, you know, kind of uh, publications uh, out there for financial news, for this, for that, for the other thing. For coronavirus, um, generally, what have I been reading lately? Um, is I've been in, in Russia, I've been reading Vedomosti, Medusa, uh, you know, uh, honestly, the Moscow website, uh, the Moscow City website's got a lot of pretty good information on there, a lot of good stats, it's kind of broken down. Uh, keeps you up to date. You know it's authoritative, right? You can trust that it's authoritative because it's coming from the, the Moscow mayor's office. Um, uh, in the U.S., I look at the CDC. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, and then generally some big publications, New York Times, The Guardian. But you've got to decide what are you know good sources for yourself. And you don't just like you shouldn't take it from me. You should invest some time and really get to know a publication well, uh, realize what their biases are, uh, figure out who owns it. You know, everybody's got a mission or an agenda. Um, so anyway, I think we've got to wrap up in a minute. Um, so, uh, it's been great, uh, chatting with you today. Uh, thank you, uh, once again for, uh, tuning in to this session of the media literacy club. Uh, let us know what you thought about this program by liking it or leaving a comment. Um, you know, we'll go back and take a look on another day and maybe get back to you. Uh, to join our other AMC online programs, subscribe to our YouTube channel, check updates on our website, amc.ru, and follow us on social media to learn, connect, and produce together. And uh, I hope to see you in this kind of format soon, and hopefully sooner rather than later. You know, maybe we'll get to do this again someday and live in person. But for now, you've got to, you know, do, do uh, what, what is asked of us uh, in terms of social distancing. Be well, be safe, wash your hands. Thank you.